Well, good morning, and it's good to be home. Um, we served here at the Woodlands United Methodist Church for nine years, and so I know so many of you. It's wonderful to see so many uh, familiar faces, and it's wonderful to see so many new faces as well, to know that the church, a church that you love, is growing in uh, faith and in friendships. Um, I've been away at Asbury Seminary for the last three years, been serving there. It's hard to believe it's been three years. And the last several weeks in particular have been some of the hardest to be away from Texas. Um, first of all, let me just thank you uh, that the week that I was coming home to speak and to preach here at the church, you somehow arranged to have the Astros win the World Series just for me. So I touched down at Intercontinental Airport about the fifth inning on Wednesday and got to watch that last game on Texas soil, which was such a gift. And it was a gift really to the whole city, to all of the Astros fans. And um, we had been watching all of those other games in Kentucky on Eastern Standard Time, which makes them even later, believe it or not. Um, so it was great to watch the last game here and to celebrate with this amazing city. Um, also, I just wanted to say that of all of those games that were hard to watch from far away, the last several months have been hard to watch from far away too, knowing that a city and a state that you love has suffered so much under a storm. But I also want to say just watching not only the national coverage, but seeing so many stories posted online, especially from this church, you made us so proud. Um, just proud to see the way that uh, this area and this church especially stepped up to help neighbors and so many people who not only were struggling but are still uh, as recovery continues. But thank you for all that you've done and just being the hands and feet of Christ to your neighbors. A good friend that I grew up with, that I was childhood friends with, I was especially trying to follow her story during the storm because I wanted to make sure she had enough help around her. My friend is a, a single mom. And as such, I wanted to make sure she had lots of people coming to help with whatever was needed, and she did. But she's one of those friends that we, we saw each other in childhood on a daily basis. We lived around the corner from one another. Um, we rode the bus together, played tennis together. Um, but these days, we really, we see each other more through uh, the internet through our posting on Facebook and other places. And I get to follow how she's doing. And I'm so proud of her and all of her challenges. She really has a life that makes anything that I face seem small. She's uh, an incredible single mom of two small kids. Uh, she has two jobs that are supposed to be part-time, but really we know that those often blossom into full-time. And a mostly uncooperative ex-husband, so she, she sees most of these challenges on her own. And she says when she wakes up in the morning on a day when things are especially challenging, she has a little mantra that she says to herself. She, she wakes up and looks herself in the mirror and says, you've got this. And she not only says it to herself, she says it to the internet, right? She puts it on her Facebook, on her Twitter feed. She hashtags things, you've got this. Uh, so on days when one of the kids is sick, both of her bosses want her to come in at the same time, uh, when the child support is late, but the bills are due, she says it more and more. You've got this, she says. Only the more she says it, the more sometimes I wonder if it's true. The more I wonder if she really does have this or if her needing to talk herself into it for the day means, boy, she really needs help. And she really needs other people to come around her. And it, and it makes me wonder too about us. Don't we all have days like that? where we sort of run out. We, we run out of resources, we run out of time, we run out of energy, we run out of money, we run out of patience for things. And, and we realize that we've run out, but where else can we turn? It's on those kind of days that you've got this, just really, it's not gonna get it. And so where do we turn on those days when we run out? It's on those days especially that I think we need a really good understanding of desperation as a gift. Now, what do I mean by that? Nobody wants a gift called desperation, do they? But it is, it is indeed a gift. It's, it's the truth that when we run out is when we are most likely to run to Jesus. 
And nowhere in scripture can that be seen more clearly than in the very first miracle that Jesus performed at the wedding at Cana, uh, the miracle where he turns water into wine. And I'm going to read that story for us from the second chapter of John, uh, just so we're all on the same page here. Even if you've heard this story many times, hear it again as if for the first time, this story of the wedding in Cana of Galilee. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, this story is from the second chapter of John. It's very early in the story. His disciples have only just begun to follow. In fact, they haven't witnessed any miracles before. This is the first. And the word missing in the story is actually the word miracle. John himself never in the whole gospel says the word miracle. Now, he, he talks a lot about miracles, but he calls them signs. John tells the story of seven signs, and this is the first. Now, why use the word sign, I wonder? You know when you are coming home from a long trip and you see the exit sign that tells you you're just about to be home, and how excited you get when you see that sign? Or when you're on your way to visit some family that you haven't seen in a long time, and you see their street sign as you turn the corner, you know the feeling you get when you see that sign? Is it the sign that you're looking forward to? It's not. Signs, we love signs simply because they point us to something else. And that's the case in this story. These signs that John talks about, they're all meant to point to Jesus. And most of the story of this sign is um, contained in a conversation between Jesus and his mother Mary. Um, Jesus and his disciples are at a multiple day, multiple, um, maybe even more than a week-long wedding feast. This is no 30-minute Methodist wedding. <laughs> this kind of wedding is one where all the guests traveled and stayed for days, and that meant that it was disastrous when the wine, which was the acceptable drink for adults in those days, uh, you weren't sure if water was safe or potable, but you knew the wine was, so that meant it was disastrous when the wine ran out before the celebration ran out. Now here's the conversation that we read between Jesus and his mother. Um, Mary is the one who begins it. Jesus, she says, Jesus, they have no more wine. Now don't you love it? I'm, I'm a mother myself. Don't you love it that mothers can make a statement that's not really just a statement? Your socks are in the middle of the living room floor. This is more than an observation. It's meant to produce results. Your room resembles a pigsty. This is not simply words spoken for the sake of the words themselves. They're meant to produce action. And so when Mary says, they have no more wine, we know that these are words leading to something. And Jesus responds, what's the word he uses to respond? Woman? Let's just stop there for a minute, really. <laughs> woman, he says. 
What concern is that of mine? My hour has not yet come. If we looked at this through our own cultural lens, through what it would sound like if we were at a wedding party and an adult son said woman to his mother, it might look like Jesus is getting a little sassy here at the wedding in Cana. And it might even seem to us that maybe the first miracle is that Mary doesn't just take Jesus out right then and there. <laughs> in any case, um, I will say I had a friend once when I was a student at the seminary where I now serve, and um, my friend, bless his heart, he decided that if Jesus addressed women in this way, he would do so as well. And so he was a biblical scholar. They do funny things. And he, um, so he would say things to us like, woman, can I borrow your notes from ethics class? You know, it was the kind of thing where he thought if it was good enough for Jesus, it was good enough for him. And so we, we let him know that crucifixion was also good enough for Jesus. <laughs> and if he wanted to start down that road, there was no telling where he would end up. In any case, Mary seems not to even listen when Jesus objects. She simply calls the servants at the party and tells them to do whatever Jesus tells them to do. Now, if you needed a mantra, if you needed to wake up in the morning and say something to yourself before your day, that's a pretty good one. Do whatever Jesus tells you to do. And so he asks the servants to bring the water jars used for ritual purification. This, this is a Jewish wedding in a Jewish household. And so somewhere in this house, maybe tucked under the tablecloths for the party, are these huge, huge water jugs meant to hold 20 to 30 gallons of water. These are not meant for beverages. They're meant for washing, for ritual purification before religious ceremonies to make sure that one was clean in order to approach God. And so he calls for the jars, which means he's asking these servants to carry probably 150 gallons worth of extra water not with a tap, not with a water hose, but fetching and carrying and bringing into the household. And that's a lot of work for these servants that have already been burdened by the extra work of a more than a week-long wedding feast and all the extra guests, not, not to mention the 12 extra guests who tagged along with Jesus, who, let's face it, may be the reason that the wine ran out in the first place. But in any case, they do whatever Jesus told them to do, and they bring the water. They fill the jars to the rim, and when the head steward of the wedding tastes the, the water, it, it's not water anymore. It's wine. And, and it's better than anything they've ever tasted. Jesus' best is always better than whatever we've started with. And he has no idea what's happened, but we're told the servants know. The servants know what's happened. And, and we're also told that this is the first of the signs that point to Jesus. The first of the signs that Jesus did and that the disciples believed in him. Uh, when my husband Jim and I got married, we uh, were some of the last in our group of friends to get married. Uh, we had waited a little later, and so we had both been involved in a lot of weddings before our own. And, and when you're single and you show up at other people's weddings, you often are taking notes about all the things that you would like to do in your own wedding. I had been a bridesmaid and a pastor at a lot of weddings. Jim had been an usher and a groomsman at a lot of weddings. And, and so we had been taking notes about all the things we liked at all these other weddings. And so when it came time for us to get married, we just did all of them. <laughs> all the things that we had liked before. We, we opened with hymns, we sang worship choruses, we had multiple scripture readings. Uh, we told the pastor involved, Dr. Rob, we said no, no little homily for us. We want a full length sermon at this wedding. We narrowed the invitation list down to 500 of our closest friends. And they came, and then we served them all communion. And it was glorious, it was beautiful, it was an hour and a half long. <laughs> no little Methodist 30 minute wedding for us. And, and the thing about having these 500 guests at our wedding is we had to figure out how to feed all of them, right? Because when you invite people to something, 
You are going to feed them. And, and the bride was a preacher, and the groom at the time was a professor. And, and let's just say the wedding of a preacher and teacher does not mean you're going to have a surf and turf buffet at the reception. So we had to figure out how to feed all these people. We came up with a solution. We held our wedding at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Now, do you know what that means when you get an invitation to a wedding at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? Cake and punch. That's what it means. And some lovely hot hors d'oeuvres. I would have to say that, but I won't bore you there. I just want to say that even if we had elected to feed all of these people a full meal, and even if we had run out of food or drink during our reception, it, it would have been a slight problem, but not a big one. We would have either sent someone for more food around the corner or told people to grab some Whataburger on the way home. But um, this was not how things worked in Jesus' day. There was no grabbing more food or wine. And in fact, this is a culture where hospitality means everything. We're not to provide what you have promised your guests is shocking. It was shame-inducing. It was reputation-ending. In fact, it turns out, I didn't, I didn't know this till I looked it up, it turns out that these guests could have sued the groom's family for not providing wine at the celebration. So this situation was desperate. These are people in a desperate, life-altering situation. And, and I love that about this story because it's the first miracle, right? And it's showing us what's about to happen in all the other miracles in the Gospels, that desperate people turn to Jesus, and he is there to save. Someone runs out, they're desperate, they're unable to help themselves, they don't got this, and they run to Jesus, and he is there with blessings that are overflowing and abundant. It's true in every miracle of Jesus's. You, you can look it up, read through the gospels and you'll find again and again that desperation always precedes a miracle. And so people who are desperate are actually in a really good position to receive a gift from God because in the gospels, if you think about it, think of all the people that receive miracles in Jesus's stories. Someone, someone is blind or lame, or dead. Someone's child is sick, or dying, or, or demon-possessed. Thousands of people are hungry and there's nothing to feed them. 10 people are walking around with leprosy, outcast from their friends and family. A woman is bent over. A man's hand is withered beyond recognition. A child is dead. These are desperate people. And Jesus is the savior of desperate people because if you're not desperate, what would you need a savior for anyway? These are people whose brokenness turns into a gift because it turns them to God. And it reminds us that we are, all of us, in need of Jesus' power, but to tell the truth, it's only the desperate who really go looking for it. Running out is not a failure. It actually might be the most fruitful point in your life. When you realize that you don't got this and that you're not enough, it may be the very point where you meet Jesus in the most powerful way. And so the question for us this morning here at the Woodlands United Methodist Church might just be this. If you haven't hit rock bottom yet, how do we get you there faster? <laughs> Isn't that what you showed up to church to find out this morning? how you can get to rock bottom. Well, there's good news about that, and it's this. Um, there are really two ways to get to the foot of the cross. You can fall there in desperation, or you can kneel there. You can get to the foot of the cross, even if your life is not falling apart, simply by kneeling there, by, by actions like repentance, humility, confession, one that we've already practiced together this morning, through intercession and prayer for those who are in marginalized and weak and desperate situations. When we pray for the desperate, our hearts become desperate. And so we can find our way to the foot of the cross and remind ourselves we really need Jesus on our very best day just as much as we did on our worst day. Our desperate situations of the past can remind us to have desperate hearts for God here in the present. 
As we look at the story of Jesus and his disciples at the wedding, we notice again this, this conversation, the conversation between Jesus and his mother, where, where Mary turns to her son and she opens the conversation with these words, Jesus, they have run out of wine. Now, if you do a little digging into wine in that history in the Bible, into the Old Testament, what you find there, especially in the prophets, prophets like Isaiah, use the word wine to talk about how people are thirsty, not just for a drink, but thirsty for God, thirsty for a Messiah, thirsty for God to show up and rescue and change desperate situations. Isaiah in chapter 24 says things like this, the new wine dries up. And the vine withers, all the merrymakers groan. Does that sound a little like the wedding? The wine has dried up, not just as a sign of our human thirst, but our deep thirst for a Messiah, for God. And then in chapter 25, when the Messiah appears, Isaiah puts it this way. He paints this beautiful picture of a banquet and of wine and this beautiful mountain. And he's not just talking about food and drink. He's talking about the fulfillment of our longings in God. Listen to this, Isaiah 25, 6. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, the finest of wines. And he continues in this this passage for All Saints Day. I love it because I've stood in this very room at so many funerals where we've read this passage to remind people what is to come when God fulfills our longings On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. And so the banquet is set. The wine overflows because the Messiah has showed up to fix all the things that are wrong. And so when Mary says, referencing Isaiah, they are out of wine. What she is saying is this, Jesus, look at your people. They're thirsty for a Messiah. Don't you think it's time? Are you ready, Jesus? They're thirsty for a rescuer. They're desperate for you. And Jesus responds, how does he respond, woman? Let's look at that word for a minute, because anywhere in the Gospels that Jesus uses the word woman, he does so with respect and dignity and compassion. After his resurrection in the garden, he says, woman, why are you weeping? And the only other place he addresses Mary with this word in the Gospel of John, he does so from the cross as he's pointing to his beloved disciple John and telling her that John will take care of her in his absence. And so he says to her, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. That word, woman, God invented that word, and he uses it with respect and dignity and compassion. And then Jesus says, the hour has not yet come. The only place he says that the hour has come is actually also from the cross in John chapter 17. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. This is not an argument between a mother and a son, a nagging and a refusal. This is a rehearsal of all the prophecies that God will come in the person of the Messiah. And it builds this beautiful bridge from Jesus' very first miracle straight to the cross. On the third day, John tells us, on the third day they went to a wedding at Cana of Galilee. What else happens to Jesus on the third day? On the third day he rose from the dead. And Jesus and his disciples on the third day show up at this wedding which is pointing us like a sign straight to the cross, they show up and Jesus takes on the role of the groom who would have provided wine for all the guests. And in this beautiful wedding story, who is the only character missing? Who would you expect to see in a wedding? The bride, right? Where is the bride? How can John tell a wedding story without a bride? Has he never seen Say Yes to the Dress? (laughs) The bride is kind of an important character here. 
Well, John leaves the bride a space for her because he's building this bridge from this wedding to the cross, straight to another wedding in Revelation, where the bride who shows up is us. The church, the bride of Christ, shows up and is presented to Jesus, the groom, to walk down the aisle to him. And how is she dressed? Tattered and muddied and desperate. The bride who has run out of her best gifts, the, gr- the bride who has used up her best, and all she has to offer her groom is her desperation. Are we still enough for you, Jesus? Will you accept us, this desperate bride? And he says, bring the ritual purification jars and fill them to the rim. We're going to need a lot of water for her. And she will be white as snow. Desperation is a gift because it points us to the fact that we will run out. We're human, and God will not, and he will provide us more than we've asked for. We ask for a little refill, and he says, here's enough wine, not just for the wedding, but for the village, not just for the village, but for the world. We asked Jesus for a little refill, and he poured out his spirit on all of creation. In, in premarital counseling, I tell brides and grooms one little word of warning. When I do weddings, I I wanna make sure they know this one thing. I say, you know, something goes wrong at every wedding. Now, why would I do that to them? That seems cruel, doesn't it? But we've built up weddings in our culture to this pinnacle, this huge point where if one thing goes wrong, some people think that the day's been ruined. And so I wanna tell them something goes wrong at every wedding. Every wedding has a moment of imperfection. Someone faints or someone steps on the bride's veil and as she goes up the stairs, her head goes back down. Um, Or a bridesmaid goes into labor. (laughs) Or a ring bearer yells out that he has to go potty. (laughs) Or he just does. (laughs) All true stories, some of which happened in this very church. There's something at every wedding that goes wrong. At our wedding, our unity candle wouldn't light. Now, as symbols go, this is an important one. When you have chosen to symbolize your union with two flames becoming one and the one does not work, it's not a good sign for the future. And so here we were in front of 500 of our closest friends and the the candle was up on a stand and we were holding our little candles upside down and they were just dripping wax on top of that wick and burying it. And we tried, and it wouldn't light, and the musician played the song again, and the soloist sang the song again, and everyone stared, and they just gave up. They stopped playing altogether. So there was silence while 500 of our closest friends stared at us. And I have to tell you this about my husband, Jim. He, he doesn't really enjoy being in front of people. He's more a behind-the-scenes person. I love to be up in front of people, but... This occasion of being up in front of 500 of our closest family and friends was a little um, frightening for him. And so that whole wedding, the whole hour and a half, he had not smiled. He he was white as a sheet. He didn't look like himself or like he wanted to marry me at all. (laughs) And so the failure of the unity candle was sort of a low point for him, and I could see it on his face. And our, our pastor came over as all the guests watched and took the candle down from the stand, and turned it sideways, and dried out that little wick and held it so that our two candles could light the one wick inside. He put it back up on the stand and he ceremonially turned to our 500 guests and our, our pastor said to them, it is lit. <laughs> And everyone laughed, and I laughed, and Jim laughed. And he looked like himself for the first time in an hour and a half, and I thought maybe he did want to marry me. (laughs) And of all the plans we made for that day, that's, that's the moment. That's my memory. That's the moment I treasured out of the whole thing, the moment we couldn't do it ourselves. We did not have it, and we had to admit it, and we needed help, and everyone came together, and God was in it, 
and it was beautiful. And so what I want to share with you this morning is this. Stop pretending that you've got this. Your desperation is not a failure. It may be the point that you get to meet Jesus the most. Stop pretending that you can do it because none of us can. None of us has it all together. And the point at which we run to Jesus is the point at which he will answer with more abundance and better abundance than we ever asked for or dreamed of. We asked for a little refill and he gives us more than our little bottles could ever hold. John says, we beheld his glory, the glorious presence of the Son of God, and in his fullness, his fullness, we all have received grace upon grace upon grace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.